Hello, everybody. Welcome to, uh, to today's webinar. Thank you all very much for joining us. Um, contrary to what's on your screen, uh, my name is actually Hannah Mole. I'm the, um, the owner of the business barn. Rosie is uh, sunning herself in Scotland for the week, so I'm afraid you've got to put up with, uh, with me today. Um, with us today, we're really lucky to have Sarah Riley. Um, so Sarah runs her business um, inspired courses. She's based in the southwest, which, as you know, is one of the uh, tourist capitals of the UK. Sarah uh, helps a uh, unique uh, glamping hospitality startup um, help them grow, become more profitable. Uh, and she does that through her inspirational podcasts. Uh, she's got a business community. Uh, she does high, runs high level courses and uh, offers next level consultancy. Um, very specifically, she supports glamping businesses. Um, and we're very lucky to have Sarah here today to offer her experience with us. Um, just a couple of uh, housekeeping things as to how the webinar is going to run. Um, I'm going to hand over to Sarah in a minute or two. Sarah's going to take roughly about 30 minutes for her presentation. Hopefully the slides and the technology will work. Um, what we will do is if you've got questions, if you could perhaps just pop them down, just type them out onto the chat. I will collate all of those and I will put them to Sarah at the end uh, so as that she can do her presentation first and then we will ask questions at the end. Um, what we'll do, if it's OK, is just do a very quick hand up um, just to make sure that everybody can hear us and or see us. So on your right hand side, hopefully you've got a little box um, and there's a there's a hand like that. Um, would you be kind enough just to give it a quick tap, please? And we can just make sure that you're all here and you can hear us. Oh, that's all looking good. That will, yeah, cool. Uh, brilliant, that looks all, uh, that's that's fabulous. Thank you. Um, so the next, before before I hand over to, to Sarah, we also just thought, and it would be useful, it's interesting for us, but also useful so, so um, for, for Sarah through her presentation. Again, in the chat, can we just establish very quickly um, who is uh, already running a glamping business and you've come to sort of look at as to, to how um, you can make improvements. So, so you've got an established glamping business or whether you're thinking about starting one. So if in the chat, if you could just type in the number one, if you're thinking about starting a business and the number two, if you've got an established business. And we'll just see very quickly out of all of you what uh, what what we've got. So that's a number one, uh, and just literally just type in a number one in the chat. A number one if you're thinking about starting a business, and a number two if you have got an established or an existing business. Can't see anything coming up at the moment. That might be the technology. Maybe failing me. What I'll do, we might Sarah, have is a shy audience. <laughs> we, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it's either my explanation or the technology, one or the other. Um, but what we'll do is, if we get going, if we start, and then if if it comes in, I can um, I can feed that into you if if you're happy. Um, so I will hand over to Sarah just now. Um, any questions, please feed them into the chat. I will, um, I will then uh, um, collate them all and we'll put them to Sarah at the end. So I'll sign off. You hopefully won't be able to see me and uh, I'll hand over to Sarah. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Hannah. That's fabulous. And thank you everyone who's here. I'm really hoping that tech gods are going to be kind to us today. It's fabulous to be able to rely on technology like this to be able to share with you without you having to travel for miles to go somewhere to listen to me speak and this is fabulous but occasionally there are glitches so I apologize in advance if that happens but also I have got a whole load of people just outside my office uh, hanging off the edge of the next door building uh, putting up some scaffolding so again I'm sorry they weren't here yesterday they're here today so as with these things it always happens and I apologize in advance for any background noise but uh, we will continue and hopefully you will get what you want out of this. So just a very quick overview of who I am. So my name is Sarah Riley. So I'm the owner of Inspired Camping and also Inspired Courses. 
I've been in hospitality for over a decade now, and so I have cleaned some bins and some sheets in my time. I know exactly how it all works. I know the pitfalls, I know the wonderful side of it. I, I know all of that, but I got very interested in glamping in about 2008 when it first started emerging as a trend. And I actually started building my own business plan for my own business. I had what I believe and still believe was a brilliant idea and I was really excited to do it. Um, and based on my hospitality experience, I thought it fitted really well with what I wanted with my lifestyle, but also with my income potential. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be. In 2009, I damaged my neck and that created a, a vortex, a blood clot, which traveled to my brain and I had a major stroke. But that's not what this is about. Thankfully, I recovered and I have been able to move forward with my business dreams. And that's why I'm now here talking to you uh, from the southwest. So in Devon, where it's just beautiful, the weather is amazing. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, today I'm going to be talking through the glamping options that are available for you. And I'm going to be talking about key factors for success that I have identified. I've been working now in the glamping industry for getting on for nine years now. And I'm invited to speak around the world about glamping. I have a glamping podcast where I interview many people and, uh, you know, have the benefit of their experience and expertise, which is just amazing. And they're happy to share openly with everyone. I also support businesses and all of that allows me to come to you today with these key factors for success. The income potential that you can generate from this type of business, evidence of market size, expectations of today's glamping customers, which I can tell you are changing and people coming into this need to be aware of that. And then also the resources available for you to help you build your business. And at the end, we're gonna do some questions, which Hannah has already talked about, she's going to do for us. So without further ado, we're moving on to the glamping options available for you. So there are many, there are many, and glamping is actually getting bigger. It's now more than just a word as we know it's a blend of glamour and camping and that's how we came up with the word glamping but it's not just now about under canvas in fact the only real uh, similarity between what it started as and now is the fact that a glamping experience should have some level of contact with nature with the outside world and being outside and, and stargazing all of those things but you can actually be glamping in a structure, a wooden structure, um, up a tree, uh, underground. There's so many different things you can now do around glamping and showing the popularity of the word glamping. Hotels are now doing glamping on their roofs in the city. Now, I don't particularly support that idea of glamping. But never mind, it's, you know, whatever people, people will vote with their feet with that one, I think. But it's all about the experience. It's about the location where the glamping is. It's about a five star experience for people in a structure. It's about, uh, there are lots of different uh, business models. And of course, with every different structure that you have, you had, have different associated maintenance costs, the capital costs of setting it up initially, the season length that you can get occupancy for, so the guests staying the fees you can charge those guests it depends on the structure and on the facilities you offer how much you can actually charge and then of course the location of where it is and then of course the weather that you usually have in your area so in the UK we know we have a wide variety of weather conditions we have very hot areas very dry areas very wet very damp very windy there's so many different things and there are different structures that are better for different things. So bear all of that in mind. Obviously, I can't cover everything today, but I will do my best to give you a good overview. 
So here we go. We start with Bell and Sibley tents. So this, these started in uh, Sahara Desert, obviously, when the army were manoeuvring around. And the great thing about the original version of this tent is that you could wind up those little uh, bits of wall at the side and it would allow for a shade over the top and air to go underneath. So it was a really good way to keep people cool. Um, now it often has the ground sheet uh, are connected to the sides because that stops the creepy crawlies from coming in but this is a really good way of setting up uh, a glamping site very very quickly with minimal disruption to the land if you depending on whether you put decking or any other structures down as well some people do um, but it also is a material that does corrode relatively quickly but it is also relatively cheap so the return on investment is quite quick um, and the maintenance costs aren't massive, but they, they do vary depending on the material because you now have a situation where lots of different companies are turning out bell tents and other structures and the quality does vary. So you have to be very careful about what you're getting yourselves into. And then there are shepherd's huts. You probably know all about these. These are based on the model that the shepherds used to use to follow their flock and monitor the flock and make sure they're okay. And especially around lambing season on wheels. And so the fact that it's on wheels and it's a very, it's a traditional structure means that uh, planners sometimes look a bit more favorable upon this kind of structure but you still need planning. Um, but that's something I'm sure Hannah can help you with, and she's done a webinar about all of that, so I'm not gonna to touch on that today. Um, but uh, these structures, they can be expensive, and uh, the quality is very variable again, so you have to pay very uh, close attention to who's building it, how rapidly they're building it, the type of wood they're using, the interiors that they promise, that kind of thing. And capital, it can these can be quite expensive, so we're talking upwards of, uh, 15,000 pounds. So renting is an option. So you can actually now uh, rent to use or rent to buy. So you can rent it as a business from some businesses. Um, and I cover that in Inspired Camping. So go to inspiredcamping.com after this webinar and you can find out more information about that. And then there's roulette, gypsy caravans and Romany wagons, whichever you like to call them. This is at Fishton Farm, an amazing little hideaway in the middle of Devon. And they've got these beautiful, um, old, uh, very original, genuine uh, caravans. And they're just, they add a level of magic to the whole experience. And I'll be talking about that level of magic. You need to focus on yourselves. Then there's canvas lodges or safari tents. These are great options for families because obviously they're bigger, we can have bigger number of rooms, there's lots more seating space and that kind of thing. So it's a really good, it's a bit more expensive, but a really good option. You have to be careful, of course, of the groundwork, any drainage. Um, you may or may not want to have a plumbed in bathroom. If you have a plumbed in bathroom, you can charge more. And that is the way the market is going. People prefer that. Um, but, you know, it does damage the land and there are off grid options. Then we have yurts and gurs. That's another name for these. Yurts are lovely. They obviously come from a very dry climate. Um, that's where they originated from, up the mountains. And they are very good in terms of windy areas. Uh, they can lack light because there's usually only light from a hole in the, in the top and the roof, so like a window. So it really depends on what you want for your guests and what your guests want but there are loads of other options too there's pavilion tents pergolas maharaj tents raj tents this is at warwick castle this is what they've set up to give people an experience which is uh, together in in harmony with the actual the whole idea of the castle and um the age of the castle and the history of the castle so people can have a piece of that history when they come and stay and that's a really clever way of keeping on brand with uh, the location and the history of the location and i would definitely say and i'll talk about that more in a minute is a really good thing to focus on then we have teepees whichever way you want to spell it and wigwams so often you can have really big structures at festivals that join up 
and create a very large space for people to uh, hang out and maybe have wedding festivals or to have big large accommodation and we have tree houses so i was privileged to work on jane field lewis's amazing book the anatomy of tree houses go and check it out if you haven't seen it it really is amazing and i had the uh I, I just loved it because I was able to interview people from around the world who had built tree houses like this and the reason they did it, how they did it, the struggles they had, why they'd made a decision to do what they did. And it's really interesting about tree houses that this is something that people, some, some people in the industry are seeing as, okay, it's a bit more of an expensive option to go with. Um, but it seems to be a real uh, popular option in terms of the guests. And then we have vintage restoration uh, projects. So we have, this is the Majestic Bus. You may have seen it on George Clark's Amazing Spaces. So have you got an old horse box lying around? Have you got old storage containers that aren't being used? Have you got an old helicopter or an empty plane hanging around? <laughs> Probably not. But if you have an opportunity to buy one, these are the things that people are now changing and adapting and renovating for people to stay in. And it's booming in terms of crazy accommodation people can now use. And this is something that we're seeing more and more of. And the great thing about this is that it does attract a lot of PR. And so that helps you with your marketing from the beginning. I will touch on that in a bit. Then we have the Lotus Bell Tent, which is a play on the Bell Tent. It's a modern version. It's got more standing room. Um, so these are a bit more expensive than the Bell Tents, uh, but they are really lovely and they look very stunning when they're actually up on a piece of land. Then we have the Dome and Geodome Tents. Now these are great tents. They are fabulous in terms of aerodynamic and they're strong because it's a really strong structure. Um, you have to be a bit careful with the insulation and with the noise of wind banging poles or tent canvas banging poles. But you pretty much have to be careful with all of these structures with that um, because that does happen, it is an issue. And if you haven't actually stayed in the structure that you're planning to buy, I would suggest you do that. That's a really good way of getting a feel for what it's actually like in different weather conditions to be inside something that you are planning to buy for your guests. Then we are seeing some amazing things coming out. This is the worm tent, it's called. These are unique shaped tents that have been developed in Korea. We are seeing a lot more stuff coming out of China now. So uh, China is starting to pick up on the glamping uh, trend. And we know what China is like. They are a powerhouse of being able to produce uh, things so we're going to see what happens as a result of that New Zealand as well has got some amazing structures they're building so the great thing about my position is that I'm able to see from an umbrella view what's going on in the world and what's coming out and I can tell you that some really exciting developments coming out in the way of glamping and new structures that are being classified as glamping so really the only limit is your imagination so okay there is going to be a limit of your budget as well and your land and the planners and all that kind of thing. But you can start with just being limited by your imagination. But there are some key factors for success. And what are they? What is it that I have identified in those that have been most successful in this industry? Well, number one, be unique, be different. Don't follow the crowd. Don't be me too. Don't do everything that everyone else is doing. So. OK, at the beginning, you will you will be successful. You will be able to attract guests, but it's not just about attracting guests for the beginning. It's about longevity. It's about making sure that your business will stay strong into the future. And one of the ways it can do that is to attract new groups of uh, customers. So you're generating lots of new guests and you can do that by being unique. Firstly, you get lots of PR your unique selling position, such as where you are, your location, what you're offering, your experience, all that kind of thing, works really well to help you attract guests into the future and to stay strong into the future. So be unique. Don't 
follow the crowd. As Oscar Wilde said, be yourself because everyone else is taken. So the next thing is start your marketing early. So this is the City Caravan Hotel. So this is in a city, but it's in a warehouse in a city. So yes, a bit strange, I know, but people have an opportunity to stay in really lovely and well renovated vintage caravans inside a warehouse, a bit like a hotel. So I'm, I'm sure you can imagine this is very unique. It's not something that's been offered anywhere else. And so this means they got a lot of PR coverage as a result. So they didn't have to start their marketing too early because it was done for them. But if you haven't got this type of uniqueness or PR magnet, you need to think about starting your marketing before you actually launch your business. So my recommendation is always when you've started, you've got your permission for your business to your planners and, and any other permissions that you need. That is the time you start your marketing. That is the time that you need to start to look at and investigate and really get to grips with how you're going to attract guests. So this is your guest attraction strategy. It starts at the beginning. I see so many times that people, they, they launch their business and then they say, OK, so where are the customers? Unfortunately, um, you know, the customers need to um, come from somewhere and they won't come unless you tell them where you are. You also need to satisfy a desire or a need. These are caravan boats. Obviously, caravan boats, then questionable how many people might need them. As a result, they weren't very successful. And you need to really study your business in terms of who your customers will be. There are so many different types of customers out there. So this is Kudfer in Cornwall, and they attract people who are real adventurers, like to throw themselves off cliffs and go surfing. And so what they offer is really fits for them. So you have to be really focused on who your customers are. But also think about you. Do you have a passion for it? Think about you. Are you going to be able to do this every day? Are you going to be able to serve people every day? Hospitality is very unique and not everyone is cut out for it. So really think about what you might love and what you might help hate. And would you have someone available to take on those things that you hate? But also be ready to change direction if you need to. Do you need to diversify and do something slightly different? So this is going into catering rather than rather than accommodation. Sometimes we have to make those shifts, but also build your relationship. This is where a festival company, Festival, festival Brides and Bluebell Tents came together and they had a joint venture relationship that worked really, really well. Together, they could provide different parts that benefited them both. Then, of course, use strong images and branding. This is the North Star Club up in Yorkshire. It's brilliant. They were on Dragon's Den, actually. So remember that you are attracting people who aren't necessarily campers. They don't necessarily love the act of camping, but they want the experience of glamping. So it's all about focusing on the experience. But again, reminding you, if you build it, they may not come unless you show them the way. If I had more time, I would show you and talk to you more about this particular project, which is the middle of Bali, totally off the beaten path. It's it, nobody comes by here. There is no natural footfall. It's very different to get there. Travel, uh, travel, the uh, whole infrastructure is really difficult to get there, but they are totally booked solid for the next year. How did they do that? Well, I share the strategy at the glamping uh, show last year and in the in America, and um, it really is a very good strategy. And I'll be happy to share that in the future. But for now, I'm afraid we're running out of time, so I'm going to have to move on quickly. So provide a bit of magic, something you can be proud of. That's what people want. They want the magic. But you want to hear about the in income potential, don't you? Well, always put your customers and service first. That's what it's about. Attract the repeats. If you attract the re repeats, you will be able to reduce your costs and that will increase your profits. Focus on your guest attraction strategy from the beginning. There are things you can do, methods that you don't know about yet that work really well and I share them all. Persevere. It's all about tiny steps. It's a football match. Sometimes you'll be scoring a goal and celebrating and sometimes you'll be laying flat down in the mud with mud all over your face. But 
that's what it is. That's what hospitality is all about. And one of the great things that you can do to help deal with that is to get involved in a network of businesses who are all going through the same thing and they support each other. And that's what I offer in my Facebook group, the Glamping Business Facebook group, where people can talk about this stuff and they can share it um, and they can share their woes, their daily woes, as well as their successes. But most of all, it's about gather the knowledge, add to to that a bit of action and you will get the results that you are looking for. So again, the direct booking success blueprint, really important to really get to grips with how you are gonna directly attract your guests because if you are gonna get involved with online travel agents or online booking agents, uh, such as these examples, and I recommend those at the beginning because it's a really good way to launch quickly, but they do take a staggering amount of commission from your income. So think about this at the beginning. So don't get locked in. Don't be careful about exclusivity clauses. Talk through very carefully the percentage that they're going to charge. Realize that they will add tax to that. So the percentage they're talking you through isn't necessarily the final percent. And be very careful. But ultimately, your strategy should be to use that at the beginning and focus on how you can attract your guests directly to book with you without having to pay those fees. Again, I share that in my blueprint. I can't talk about it here because we're running out of time. I'm almost late. Sorry. So moving on. So here we have uh, an agent classic glamping. This is something they've set up in Cornwall uh, with the landowner. Um, so it's not just about what you can earn, it's also about your costs. So what costs are going to have to come out of that? How much money are you going to have to pay upfront to set up something like this, which has ensuite facilities, drainage, a uh, uh, tap that you turn on and off, all of that kind of stuff, cooking facilities, a uh, decking, and it for it to look beautiful. Well, in this example, and this is only one example, and please be aware that every single method of glamping is different. It will bring in different money, it has different season lengths, it has different maintenance costs, different outlay at the beginning. It's all different. You cannot just take this as the only amount, but this is the example for this particular structure. It's between 25 and 30,000 to set all of this up. And per year, using the online travel agent, you possibly, hopefully, would be attracting 12 to 15,000 per year in bookings. Obviously, that is a brilliant, almost 50% return on investment, but bear in mind that that is all dependent upon your costs and on your occupancy. So those are things you need to really focus on. So we're gonna look at the market size. I'm racing now, I'm really sorry because we are late. It was only half an hour. So uh, camping, we can see uh, Google is telling us that camping is on a slow decline. Uh, it's changing. People's wants and needs are changing. As millennials are coming in, they are starting to demand different things and we are seeing big companies shift as a result. We're seeing Airbnb shift, booking.com shift, Expedia. Under Canvas is a massive glamping site in uh, America who I have met and interviewed and they are opening 15 new sites because they've attracted major investment. Centre Parks is setting up, has set up glamping. Celebrities are getting involved in it. Festivals are getting involved in it. As a result, Google is telling us this is the upward trend of glamping, but it is all about offering an experience. It's all about being unique. It's all about tapping into this new market and being authentic and genuine and offering a low impact green activity that people who have now got bigger uh, green uh, ethics and want to you know, support their environment really want to get involved in. But there are challenges. The Journal of Outdoor Recreation and Tourism said in 2013, that it is in need of academic research to research glamping, but it did say that it had a stellar performance during the recent global financial slowdown in 2009, 2008, 2009. So what are the expectations of today's glamping customers? Well, they want an experience. They're talking and demanding new things, new activities. This is alpaca checking. So look at the assets you already have. Do you already have a petting area? Do you have lots of small animals? Do you sell amazing farm food? Uh, do you offer experiences on your land, in your buildings, all that kind of stuff? Do you have skills you could share? 
painting, um, some kind of educational skill. This is what people want. They want an experience. It's not just about the accommodation. It's so much more than that. So while you're developing this, what you need to do is think about, be thoughtful, creative, and offer something special. And then you will really hook people in to stay with you and to come back year and year again. This is old data, 2013, but these uh, amounts have not shifted very much. These are the facilities offered at European campsites, and we can see the top three are sauna, massage, and outdoor pool. So you might want to think about what can you do in addition to the accommodation to really help attract people in. So what resources are out there for you to help you? I have a podcast, so you can find it on inspiredcamping.com. I have done an episode on there with the Business Barn on how farmers are using glamping to manage income fluctuations throughout the year. So you might want to put in inspiredcamping.com forward slash 005 as it is episode five. Have a listen to that. I also have a fun and informal quiz. So to ask, are you cut out to run a glamping business? So you can find that over on inspiredcourses.com forward slash quiz. And finally, I do also offer a number of free resources. So I have a Master Your Hospitality Business Marketing ebook, which you can download absolutely for free. And I've also talked through there the accelerators that lead to hospitality success and the common mistakes that people often make when they come into this industry. To access that, you can go to inspiredcourses.com forward slash resources. So sorry for rattling through all of this, but we have looked at the glamping options, the key factors for success, income potential, evidence of market size, expectations of today's glamping customers and the resources available for you. Um, we have run out of time. I've tried to keep to time, um, but I just wanted to finally just let you know that if you feel that you are now in a position where you want to get really serious about your business and set it up quickly, avoid the mistakes that are there, and to learn from the experiences of others, I'm offering just for people watching this on the Business Barn a 20% discount if you feel you are ready to access my help. So I do the Ultimate Glamping Business Startup Guide, which talks you through every single phase, including your early marketing of what you need to do to set up a glamping business. So you can find that over on inspiredcourses.com. And also using the same code, if you are interested in accessing the Hospitality Success Direct Booking Blueprint, which gives you a, an a marketing masterclass. It gives you everything you need to know to really focus on everything to do with your marketing and to not have to rely on paid commissions. Again, there is the code BB20. Just for Business Barn uh, viewers, you can get a 20% discount. And finally, the um, I do also do, I recognize that people do want to pay for ads sometimes. And one of the best places, one of the best platforms to pay for those ads in this industry is on Facebook. But Facebook is a very complicated platform in terms of its ads and its advertising. And I know that many people have not been able to succeed with it. So I have put together a Facebook ads made easy for hospitality, which also includes the ads quick impact formula and best practice from this industry. So you can see what other businesses are doing and how it's working for them. Again, you can use the same code for this Business Barn webinar. And please, you know, if you do feel you're ready to work, just go to inspiredcourses.com and you can go to the contact page and just drop me a message and tell me uh, what you thought of this webinar. Ask me any questions you want. And, uh, you know, if you want to talk some more about your particular project, I'd be very happy to hear from you. So sorry for racing through the last bit of that uh, webinar, but I realized that I was going to be over the time. So I had to swiftly move on. So, Hannah, uh, thanks for joining me back. And um, any final questions? Did any final questions come in? Thanks, Sarah. No, that's really, really interesting. All of it's been, um, been fascinating. So thank you. Um, we have got some questions. I just want to 
case anybody can't find to where uh, where um, there's a little red arrow on the right hand side of your screen um, if you press that it expands the uh, the sort of mini dashboard um, and you can type in questions at the bottom so uh, I've got a que couple of questions here that have come in um, if anybody's got any questions now and you want to type them in then I can ask Sarah towards the end um, so the first question, and I, I would hazard a guess to say this is um, as long as a piece of string, <laughs> but the, um, Georgie has asked, which type of accommodation generally and in your experience gives the quickest return from investment? <laughs> um, yes, it is as long as a piece of string. Um, well, it is, the answer is not simple or straightforward. So I've produced a whole ebook, which is in my glamping start, startup guide, which goes through everything from the maintenance, how much it costs to buy it, the return on investment, uh, the season length, because there's so many different things. Depending on the structure, you get a, a longer number of uh, days of the year that people can stay with you. So of course, so you may have uh, put in more money to pay for that structure, but you're getting people staying with you for longer because you've had insulation or you've got heating and things like that. So your season is much longer. So also if you have, um, uh, say for example a, a bell tent um, it's much cheaper to buy you will get a quick return on your investment but your season is very short you won't necessarily get the uh, the uh, profits that you want because you won't be building the income that you want because it's a very short season um, and you will have to replace the canvas very regularly because it discolors very regularly so it's really very difficult. It depends on your land, how windy is it, you know, what's the weather, there's just so many factors. So you just have to look at all of the factors as a whole. So if, and, and apply it to you and your situation and where you are. So without me knowing any of those things, I can't really tell you. So I'm really sorry, um, but it, <laughs> it's a very, very complicated answer. answer. <laughs> Um, so Claire has said if she wanted to start to do some budgets uh, in preparation for uh, setting up a glamping business, could you give her a guide as to what occupancy she should budget for at the start? That's a very, very good question. Um, this is something that, again, it varies. It very much depends on how much effort you're putting into your guest attraction strategy. So if you set up your bell tents, for example, um, that doesn't necessarily mean you will get customers from the offset. So uh, your occupancy is the percentage of time of your season length that you have been able to fill it. So the number of days in that season length, not the whole year, just the season length, um, and how many times you have booked the, that particular structure out. So I always put as a guide, uh, again, this requires effort you should start at a minimum of 50% for your first year. So your first year should be 50% and then building every year after that, uh, smaller incremental amounts. Obviously you can, you can uh, grow quicker. So if you do a very unique structure and you work very hard to get lots of PR coverage and you get some joint venture um, partnerships going and you get some influences involved to help promote your business, you are going to fly much quicker. So it really depends on what you do to generate PR and marketing around your business. This is not a set the structures up and then hope people will come. This is not the Kevin Cosner's field of dreams. It just doesn't work that way. You really have to focus on your guest attraction strategy, but start from 50% and look to increase that year on year on year by an amount that you feel is achievable for the time you have to be able to focus on your marketing. Um, I think it's Ian, if I can see this correctly, has asked, um, do you think hot tubs are vital for success? Yeah, very good question again. Gosh, so many good questions. Um, hot tubs are known and have been shown to increase occupancy. Uh, so if particularly if you are inland, you don't have any natural pools or lakes or the sea or the beach or anything like that. So if you're lacking those kinds of facilities, a hot tub is shown to um, achieve an increase in occupancy. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean you will increase the money you earn through your structure. It just is definitely shown that it will increase your occupancy. Um, however, 
there are some very strict regulations around hot tubs and the type of hot tubs that meet those regulations. Be careful who you ask that question to because <laughs> Um, it does create an awful lot of passionate debate amongst people around hot tubs and wooden hot tubs especially. And this is all about Legionnaire's disease. This is all about keeping yourself safe in terms of health and safety and obviously your guests safe. Um, but in terms of litigation that you could actually find yourself with. Um, because depending on the type of hot tub, you will be required to empty it and flush the water and clean it every few hours if it is not a self-filtering system. Um, however, I haven't looked at the legislation for a while, so don't rely on what I just told you there. What you need to do is to go to the Health and Safety Executive and look at their regulations around pools and hot tubs and that will give you the up-to-date regs and then you'll be able to figure out if a hot tub you're planning to buy will meet those codes and also make sure that whoever you're thinking of buying a hot tub from can prove to you that it meets those codes because hot tub sellers will be happy to sell to you they aren't mm -hmm. the ones that are going to be you know taken to court if something terrible happens and it does happen it has been shown to happen and um, unfortunately Legionnaires is anything with, that creates a mist even so you can breathe it in you don't actually have to swallow the water you can just breathe it in that can still give you um, the bacteria so be super careful about you know the type of model that you um, invest in um... Sometimes it's the boring stuff, isn't it, that you have to think about on these things. It's a shame, isn't it? But uh, um, uh, all very valid points. Uh, I think it's Catherine has said that she'd like to make a point that um, yurts can have windows, PVC in the canvas or wooden frames, glazed windows built into the trellis. And um, also a stable door can allow light into the yurt. So I think she was just uh, sort of adding, adding that and, and, and yeah. onto what yeah. you were saying. No, it's a very good point. The traditional design of the yurt doesn't have that, but the, um, the more modern design of the yurt does. Yes, she's absolutely right. Um, Ian has asked the question, which um, is, what is the, this is another great question, what is the typical age range of glampers? Yeah, um, it really depends on your location, it depends on the country you live in, it depends on what you're offering, uh, it really does vary. Uh, we are seeing now uh, the Millennials report. So um, a big report was done on Millennials and this, I can't remember the exact age range for Millennials, but I know that they're much younger than me. <laughs> um, but Millennials are coming in and this research has proven that Millennials are wanting to pay for travel. But they don't just want to pay for travel, they want to pay for an experience. And this is what's got Airbnb, Booking.com, Expedia and all those companies a bit hot under the collar because they realise that they are just offering accommodation, they're not offering experiences. So they're now suddenly going out there and investing in all of these businesses. So Under Canvas is one in the US. You, uh, I've um, uh, interviewed the owner of Under Canvas that's on the podcast. You can uh, listen to her experiences about all of that. Um, that was a big travel company investing in her business and uh, she is now opening 15 more sites across the US as a result. So, um, you know, this is shifting sands. Things are changing. So millennials are the new market. The existing market, it's definitely more than just campers. So it's not just traditional campers who are now deciding to do glamping. This is people who used to stay in B&Bs and holiday cottages and um, in hotel rooms and they may still do that as well uh, but they want to have another experience and they're looking for those uh, facilities and the comfort and the luxury of all of that but in a glamping uh, scenario so they can light a fire and they can do things like that so um, you know it means that they can have all of those wonderful experiences but also have all the comfort that they're used to so it's opening up the market massively it's attracting more people in so this market is definitely bigger uh, than just campers but I can't give you an age range because there are so <laughs> many sorry <laughs> Um, Duncan has asked uh, how difficult it is, how difficult is it to use agricultural land for glamping? He hasn't specified, but I presume he probably means from a planning perspective. 
that's one for you then hannah <laughs> you can have first dibs if you like <laughs> um, well um I, I, okay so there are there are many people who uh, can advise on your particular land they can come and have a look at it they can give you advice um so i offer the principles in my startup guide hannah is an expert who knows all about planning there are other experts as well who can give you advice for your particular land so it's not really that there's a, any uh, rule of thumb um Planners are usually very supportive of agricultural uh, businesses trying to diversify into other areas, but it depends on the land, depends where you want to situate it, how much of an impact it will have on all of that. Wildlife in the area, all that kind of stuff has an impact. But I believe, Hannah, you did a, a webinar around uh, glamping and planning. I don't know if you want to talk about that quickly. Um, yeah, so Duncan, if you, um, when you go, when we finish this and you want to go back onto the business barn, in the webinar section, there are sort of upcoming webinars and then um, uh, already done webinars. And I did one a few weeks ago, which was just on planning for glamping. So, and I talk through the sort of different scenarios, much as Sarah has today, but uh, sort of with specific um, guidance to, to, to planning. Generally speaking, as Sarah has said, um, because it puts money into the rural economy, because there are uh, economic and social benefits and environmental benefits of glamping most uh, sort of councils are supportive from a planning point of view there are a few what we call deal breakers um, there's a couple of things you have to be able to get safe access safe highways uh, if you can't achieve that then um, then it could be a non-starter um, the second thing is um, there are designations across the country one of which is called the green belt uh, if you're in the green belt, that can also be very, very difficult to overcome. The government hold it in a sort of very, give it very significant weighting in terms of protecting the green belt. So uh, occasionally you can get some very small scale glamping things through on the green belt, but don't expect to be able to build anything very substantial in the green belt. There are slightly lesser designations, things like AONBs, which are areas of outstanding natural beauty. Um, and again, uh, normally you can get you can get it through in AONBs, but you've just got to there's a higher bar in terms of sort of demonstrating that uh, you, you're not harming the, the the landscape and so on. So generally speaking, start from the point of uh, you should be able to get planning, um, but then there are lots of hurdles and lots of sort of practical things that you have to be able to demonstrate robustly and clearly to the council in order to, to, to demonstrate that there's going to be going to be no harm um, from your proposal. But the, the the webinar does go through it. So um, and as as per Sarah, if you know if if you want any more, just over the phone advice, I'm more than happy to help. I think we've just got one final question, Sarah, and then I think we'll call it a day because it's uh, we're 20 minutes over, which is great. Everyone has stuck with us. Yes, um, thank you. And actually, this is a question. This is a question from me. Um, are there alternatives for people that either don't have the capital to start, say, for example, to go out and um, buy a safari tent let's use that as an example they don't have the 30 grand to go out and, and do it uh, you know presumably that's not including things like groundworks and stuff anyway um, do certain companies offer the opportunity to say be able to rent it from them or are there alternative ways of financing um, a sort of capital startup instead of just going out and spending 30 grand yes absolutely um yes a brilliant question um it is uh definitely possible to do that uh banks just like with this whole industry um nothing is standard everything is different be unique look at it differently look outside the box there are lots of different ways of doing this so um one such way is to buy to rent which i i mentioned earlier so go to inspired um inspired camping.com and look in the glamping business uh, section and you will find all kinds of inspirations there about how you can buy structures and then uh, you only put a small amount down and then your rent that you gather from renting it out will then go towards paying the full amount and um, so it's buy to rent um, but also uh, crowdfunding so this is something that r is really popular for crowdfunding because obviously you're offering millennials are on the cloud funding platforms and you are offering something that millennials are really interested in which is experiences travel unique experiences all that kind of stuff so crowdfunding is something that people are really interested in we've actually got someone from my group who are currently doing a crowdfunding campaign right now um, so it's really interesting to see how that's working she got 50 percent or she has already got 50 percent of what she wanted within the first 24 48 hours of launching her campaign which is brilliant 
and then she was approached by a bank who said if she gets her full amount which um, she's halfway there already she's got another month to go um, they will match fund it for her uh, in return for a little bit of PR so a great joint venture there so if you want to find out more about crowdfunding it is not just uh, it's not as easy as just throwing up a crowdfunding project there is a structure to this. It is important to follow the structure, otherwise you will fail. And there are many projects that do fail with their crowdfunding. But if you want to find out more about that, just go to inspiredcourses.com forward slash crowdfunding. So that's inspiredcourses.com forward slash crowdfunding. And that will give you uh, some inspirations on how you can get some money for your project without having to go to the banks. Brilliant. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. It's been really, really good all the way through, and um, I think I think everyone has, has has picked up snippets and things. And obviously, everyone, you've heard where to get hold of Sarah if uh, if you would like to. Um, we're going to pop all of the questions onto our forum, so uh, so so Sarah can probably go through and, and answer some of her own questions again. Uh, so if you want to revisit those questions and those answers, um, and also this webinar has been recorded, so as that you'll be able to go on and rewatch it uh, uh, at any time afterwards. That will all be available on the Business Barn website. Um, so it's just to say thank you very much to Sarah. Thank you all for joining and uh, staying with us. Uh, that's uh, it's been a fantastic attendance, um, and uh, we've got some more webinars coming up soon. So keep your eyes peeled on the uh, on the website, and uh, hopefully we'll have some more things for you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Em. Bye. 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 Bye.